Well, good morning, everybody. Today we're in Revelation 13, so go ahead and be opening your Bible there. And I want to also make sure to invite you to be in worship with us this Sunday at First Baptist Church here in Rock Hill. Invite someone to come with you. I'm going to be teaching from the book of Revelation on who is Jesus. What do we learn about Jesus Christ from the book of Revelation? What are some of the images and what does that tell us about who Jesus is as, as we get ready to celebrate Christmas, we're going to learn about Christ from this last book in our New Testament. Well, chapter 13 um, is in some sense a continuation of chapter 12. If chapter 12 gives us a, a behind-the-scenes look at the spiritual warfare taking place that plays out in human history with the way Satan persecuted Israel, Jesus, and the church and that we overcome through the blood and by being faithful and by sharing the gospel. Chapter 13 um, also takes a look at the spiritual war taking place behind the scenes that was playing out in human history in the first century and has lessons, principles that apply to us today. The context, remember, the context were those seven churches that are talked about in the first two chapters symbolized in chapter 1 as the seven lampstands that Jesus was walking among. They were being persecuted. Those churches existed in what we today know as, as the western part of the nation of Turkey. At that time in history, they were known as Asia. Uh, Rome dominated the world, and Rome had a province, had you know, divided their, 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 their empire into provinces. And, and this part of Turkey was known as Asia. So these seven churches in Asia, we would not refer to that necessarily as Asia today, but they did then. And throughout much of the early history of the church, that part of the world is where Christians often suffered some of the most severe persecution. And so they're being persecuted. We, we see that very clearly in what is said in, in the first two chapters, uh, chapters two and three, rather, of Revelation. So that's the context. Um, and, and so when you know that and you read it in that light, so we have here the dragon and these two beasts. Um, and let's read the verses and then talk about that a little bit. Chapter 13, um, verse 2. Um, well, starting in verse 1. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, and then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Then drop down to verse 2, and the beast which I saw, he describes it. And remember, all the details of the image aren't necessarily saying anything. They're there for dramatic impact or effect. At the end of verse 2, and the dragon, mentioned in verse 1, gave him, the beast, mentioned in the middle of verse 1, so the dragon gives to the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. Remember in chapter 12 yesterday, we saw that Satan, the dragon, persecuted Israel, persecuted Jesus, and persecutes the church, and often does that through nations and through leaders. So here, the dragon, Satan, empowers this first beast and gives him a throne, a kingdom, if you will, and authority. Uh, in verse 7, it was also given to him, given to this beast to make war with whom? With the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. So it was a large empire and he persecuted this nation, this beast persecuted God's people. Now look at verses 11 and 12, the second beast. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He spoke like the devil. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. In other words, this second beast gets his authority from the first beast. The first beast got his authority from the dragon. So the devil gives authority to the first beast that rules the nations, and that Empire, that first beast, gives his authority to the, to the second beast. And here's what the second beast does with his authority. Verse 12, he exer exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. The first beast. What is all that talking about? And I know you've heard a lot of stuff over the years, but listen. 
the devil who empowers leaders and nations. The first beast is Rome, the Roman Empire that ruled so much of the world and was persecuting those believers in Asia, in western Turkey, those seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. Persecuting has authority, rules, dominates the world, and often persecuted God's people. The second beast causes people to worship the first beast. That's the, that's the cult of emperor worship. See, in Rome... The emperor was viewed as deity. He was actually called, and I don't know Latin, so I won't try to speak it, but it translates as the deity, a deity. And when Nero, who ruled uh, in the middle part of the first century, was emperor Caesar of Rome, he actually had coins uh, minted that, that were stamped uh, not only with his image, but had the wording Savior of the World. In other words, Nero was referred to by the Romans on their coins as Savior of the World. And and, and Christians, actually everybody, it was demanded at times that they would pay homage to, that they would worship Caesar, the Roman emperor, the emperor of the empire. And so this, this, this cult of emperor worship is the second beast. Um, the uh, emperor Domitian, who ruled later in the first century and led some of the most severe persecution of Christians in Asia, um, was addressed, and this is the English translation of that Latin phrase, he, this, this emperor was ad- addressed as our Lord and God. Our Lord and God. Now, to Christians, to say that about an emperor would have been blasphemous. It's one of the reasons they were persecuted. We, we have so many, we, we have these stories, these accounts of Christians in the first century and second century who were martyred for their faith because they would not pay homage to, they would not worship the Roman emperor, the Caesar, the, the religion of the Roman Empire that said, you can worship anybody you want to, but you have to also worship Caesar, the emperor, who represented the Roman Empire. And Christians would not do that, and they died as a result. Now, we have in this chapter the mark of the beast, the 666. I want you to remember something. Earlier in Revelation, back in chapter 7, I believe it's verse 3, God made certain that the angels marked on the foreheads his people. Before you ever get to the beast. And then those who are not God's people who don't have the mark of God on their forehead, then they later mark of the beast. Don't buy into the stuff about there are going to be, you know, marks on foreheads or some chip put in you. All that is saying is that God marks and knows who are his. And by the way, those who, are, who belong to the beast, who belong to, to the devil, who, who worship the emperor instead of Jesus then, who worship whatever or whoever now instead of Jesus, they're marked with an evil mark. And God knows. God, it's, it's, it's reiterated time and time again through different images and revelation that God marks and knows who are his. And those who are not his are also identified and marked. God knows. There's no blurring the line. There's no ambiguity. There's no being mistaken. God knows which mark is on everybody. God knows you're either his or you're not. No confusion with God. Um, And notice that when when he talks about the 666 in verse 18, here is wisdom. He said, if you really want to understand this, you really want to be wise. Here's wisdom. Let him, who underst- let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man. And that's important. That of a man. And his number is 666. 666. The divine number was seven. Six is less than seven. What he's saying is, This is not a God. 
It's just a man. The emperor is not a god. He's just a man. This cult of worshiping the emperor that the Roman Empire said you had to do or they persecuted you, and it's the reason Christians were persecuted, is not a divine religion. It's man-made. And even in our world today, all of these philosophies and all these different religions, 666, they're none of God. They're man-made. Um, those who read this in John's day would have gotten it right away. They would have understood. And we miss the message of it when we think it's all about something yet to be. The teaching, the truth, the principles, the lessons for us is whatever empire rises Satan can do that. He can raise up a nation. He can raise up a philosophy. He can raise up a, a leader. And, and, and we saw in the previous chapter that his purpose is to deceive and deceive people, even deceive God's people if they don't stay faithful to Jesus, to the blood of Jesus and to the testimony of Jesus and, and, and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Satan can empower and he can deceive. And when we don't worship him, because listen, our world today is encouraging us. They say, it's okay if you worship Jesus so long as you compromise and worship all these other things. It's okay if you go to church so long as you compromise and do all these other things. The Romans didn't care if they worshiped Jesus so long as they also worshiped the emperor. And Satan still today is at work trying to get people to walk away from Jesus or to kind of marry Jesus with everything else. And it um, doesn't work. doesn't work. God's people, and this will be my last comment, chapter, 10, chapter 13, verse 10, at the verse, very end of it, here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. We keep the faith and we persevere. We keep the faith and we don't ever quit. And if we have godly wisdom, that's what we do. Well, I know that's a lot. Look forward to seeing you in church on Sunday. And then uh, Monday, we'll pick up with chapter 14. God bless you, everybody.